Ya. Hi, Dr. Pandi. Research started out there. You're on mute. <laughs> mm. How's research over there? Back to campus? Yeah, research we do, uh, but classes online, yeah. Okay. You can see I'm back in my office. <laughs> <laughs> we all work from office already now. Okay. So how, this, uh, just to get a picture, so all most participants are postgraduate students, right? And the faculties also. Oh, okay. Anyone doing my type of research there? Because I'm just giving like an overview for the students. Mm. Yeah, they do actually. They do. Uh, okay. 
uh, I try to keep it simple because I think too much. Also, the student very confused to understand anything. I mean, uh, uh, most of them are faculty. I think they can be able to follow you actually. Oh, okay, okay. No problem. So how's the family? All are good. Uh, One thirty. So it's morning there, right? Eleven a.m. Yeah, now eleven o'clock. Yes, morning. So. Can you hear clear? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm not using the earphone. It's better uh, not to use. Yeah. Actually, the system uh, audio is good when compared to the the headphone. Because my ears hurt wearing the earphone. <laughs> hey, you got the thesis, Kamini? Anything? Not yet. Yeah. I need to remind her again. She told me she has given to you. That's why I was wondering. Maybe I remind her again. This is compulsory for the students, is it? Uh, no, this one uh, for faculty, sometimes they need uh, this kind of uh, certificate, like faculty development program. So they need oh, to participate. So like a research methodology course here. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. They need to keep actually. So uh, many universities, they, they do conduct this faculty development program for a week. And those certificate, uh, they use it for the I mean, for academic students here. Ah, okay. Okay. Good morning, madam. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning to all the participants. Yeah, we are welcoming for the third day and third edition of this uh, international faculty development program on uh, roadmap for field clinical research. So today's session is going to be given by uh, Dr. Dharmanidhi Murugan. So he's working as associate professor, Department of Pharmacology, uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, now I request uh, my colleague, Mr. Iswa Tony, to give a brief profile of uh, Dr. Dharmani Murgan. Tony? Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning, madam. Uh, very good morning to all the participants. And uh, this is Ishwar Tony, Eastern Professor, Department of Pharmacology. And uh, welcome to the day three of uh, International Faculty Development Program on a roadmap for preclinical research. I would like to introduce you our today's speaker. It's my immense pleasure to invite you, madam. And uh, let's have a brief profile regarding Dr. Dharmani, madam. Dr. Dharmani Devi Murugan did her degree in bachelor of biomedical sciences and went on to receive her PhD in pharmacology in 2008 from University of Malaya, Malaysia. She is currently serving as an associate professor at the Department of Pharmacology at Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, Malaysia. Her research interest is in exploring the role of oxidative stress, renin angiotensin system and endoplasmic reticulum stress in modulating metabolic and cardiovascular diseases like hypertension, obesity, and diabetes mellitus, mainly investigating their role in modulating vascular tone. 
her research group focuses on identifying the potential role of peptides nitrates and the natural products in protecting vascular function in various cardiovascular diseases using animal models she has published 37 isa articles in her field and have an h index of 15 let us invite heartfully our today speaker dr dharmani madam we welcome you madam and thank you for being a part of this international faculty development program and let's let us hand over session to dr dharmani madam thank you thank you very much for the kind introduction um let me share my screen Are you all able to see my slide? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Trying to minimize things. Right. Um. It's morning there, so good morning, everyone. Uh. Firstly, let me thank the organizer, especially Dr. Pandey, for giving me the opportunity, uh, to share my knowledge in this seminar. So what I'll be talking about today is endothelial dysfunction and metabolic syndrome and potential of food and natural product. So what my talk will cover is I'll briefly uh, explain what is metabolic syndrome, the role of endothelium, how endothelial dysfunction relates to metabolic syndrome, the impact of natural product on endothelial dysfunction, and I'll share some uh, findings that has been uh, done in our lab. So first thing we have to understand when we say metabolic syndrome, it is involves metabolism. So metabolism is a vital biochemical reaction that transform nutrients into energy and also biomass. So there's a several organs that play a role in the metabolism control, like digestive system and pancreas, the, exo uh, the exocrine uh, gland, transform food into nutrients while the endocrine pancreas, the liver, adipose tissue, uh, muscles, they are involved in nutrient storage. So in an organism, they're all cells rely on metabolism for their function and also survival. And this includes the blood vessel. It also has its own metabolism. Therefore, a healthy metabolism is required for a healthy life. So our generation is actually witnessing a huge increase in uh, metaboli metabolism affections, and this is clustered and is known as metabolic syndrome, or sometimes they like to use the abbreviation of MS. So what is metabolic syndrome? Metabolic syndrome is actually a cluster or condition that occurs together. Okay, This condition includes increase in blood pressure, Uh, insulin resistant or increase in blood glucose, visceral obesity, uh, decrease in the good cholesterol, okay, the HDL, and increase in the bad cholesterol like uh, high, uh, triglyceride and so on. So usually when we say someone is having a metabolic syndrome, it usually has uh, two or three of the characteristics that's here. But um, if you look at papers and all, a lot of it they relate this to um, obesity mostly. Okay? Now, metabolic syndrome can compromise the immune system. So usually if you read papers or articles about obesity, it's known as a low-grade uh, chronic inflammation. And it poses a greater risk of uh, developing stroke, heart disease, and also type 2 diabetes. Now, why we talk about all these risk factors is all of these factors eventually leads to oxidative stress, a phenomenon where there's an imbalance in production of free radicals that's formed and also uh, in our inability of our body to defend against this uh, reactive oxygen species. So most of the causes of death that is related to metabolic syndrome patients is not Uh, the symptoms like because you have high glucose or high blood pressure, it's because the uh, is due to the cardiovascular complication. 
And cardio, when we talk about that, <clears throat> before it comes to the event of cardiovascular complication, the first thing that happens is endothelial dysfunction. So endothelial dysfunction is always known as a hallmark of cardiovascular uh, events. So usually when we have all these risk factors, as I mentioned that you see with metabolic diseases, you first see the endothelial dysfunction. And this is even seen before you see any structural changes in the blood vessel. And of course with obesity and all, later on you have the progression which may lead to the occurrence and also the development of atherosclerosis where your blood vessel become more uh, uh, clogged with fatty streaks and so on and this will uh, decrease the diameter for the blood flow and this is what leads to the cardiovascular events. So before I talk about endothelial dysfunction, let us understand the uh, role of endothelium first. So what is endothelium? It's actually a single layer of squamous endothelial cells that line the interior surface of the blood vessel, so on the inner side. And it acts as an interface between the circulating blood and also the rest of the vessel wall. Now, blood vessel or endothelial cells and uh, are crucial for vascular hemostasis. And the total surface area is about 3,000 square meters, which if you take it out and spread it, it's, it's the size of a six tennis court. And if you weigh it, it's almost the size of a human liver. Now, why is endothelium important? What does it do? So endothelium actually releases a series of substances, mainly to maintain or moderate the vascular tone and it does so by releasing mediators that modulate <clears throat> the relaxation and contraction of the blood vessel. So the vasodilators that's commonly that's released by the endothelium is like nitric oxide, prostacycline, endothelium derived hyperpolarizing factor and so on and contractile factors that is released by the endothelium is like angiotensin 2, endothelin, thromboxane, reactive oxygen species, uh, process glandings, and so on. Okay. So <clears throat> besides releasing mediators that modulates the vascular tone, it also releases factors that uh, controls the inflammation, okay, controls angiogenesis, controls the vascular permeability, controls the vascular smooth muscle proliferation and migration, okay, uh, coagulation, and so on. So any disturbance in this tightly regulated equilibrium is what leads to endothelial dysfunction. So when we are studying about endothelial dysfunction, depending on what are the uh, main thing we are looking at, are we looking at the inflammation or if we are looking at the angiogenesis, we can look at the mediators that is relevant to that particular uh, condition. So here, we mostly work on um, endothelial function. So our main focus is usually on the uh, vascular tone. So when we talk about uh, endothelial dysfunction, even if it's for the other factors, the most important one is the nitric oxide or NO. So this is the primary uh, endothelium derived relaxing factor that is released by most of the vascular bake. And this is released by the enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. Since it's present on the endothelium, it's known as the endothelial nitric oxide synthase uh, because there's also other type, uh, subtypes of the uh, NOS that is available. Now, nitric oxide synthase <coughs> releases uh, NO uh, in response to um, mediators, okay, endothelial. Um, that uh, activates the receptors or by the mechanoreceptors uh, that is activated by the uh, shear stress okay, or the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. Now the NO that is released by the endothelium will rapidly diffuse to the vascular smoke muscle and activate guanolite cyclase which is a second messenger and this produces the cyclic GMP and this will lead to the vascular uh, 
uh, smooth muscle relaxation, or we call it as vasodilatation. Now, here I highlight nitric oxide because besides controlling the vascular tone, nitric oxide is also uh, important to maintain the hemostasis of the uh, endo uh, sorry the vascular walls. So it does so by inhibiting or reducing the oxidation of LDL. It also plays a role in reducing oxidative stress, also involved in reducing monocyte and platelet additions, uh, decrease the expression of addition molecules, decrease platelet aggregation, decrease vascular smooth muscle proliferation, and decrease inflammation. So NO is one of the most important mediators when we are talk about the endothelial function. Now, endothelial dysfunction is often a consequence of oxidative stress. Just now earlier, I mentioned that oxidative stress is uh, uh, the pathway that is uh, commonly leads to all the signs and symptoms that we see following metabolic uh, syndrome. Okay, so what is oxidative stress? So oxidative stress is an imbalance between the production and accumulation of free radicals in the cells and tissues and uh, the ability of our body system uh, to detoxify these reactive products. So our body okay, has antioxidant mechanism, usually enzymatic ones like sodium dismutase, putathione peroxidase, catalase, and so on. And we, our body also produces free radicals such as superoxide, hydroxide radical, hydrogen peroxide, peroxy nitrate, and so on as a part of metabolic byproduct, okay? And usually in the normal physiological state, we still have free radicals, but it will be in a low level. However, when the free radicals uh, production increases, they will start showing harmful effects to important cellular structures such as the lipid, the protein, and also the nucleic acid. So where does this reactive oxygen species come from? Okay. So the sources for uh, reactive oxygen species are NADPH oxidase. Uh, sorry, let me just glutathione, uh, sorry, cytochrome P450 oxidase, xanthine oxidase, cyclooxygenases, okay, uncoupling of enos, and so on. So what does this do when these uh, enzymes are activated? It will produce superoxide anions or free radicals. So ROS that is produced okay, will increase the intracellular calcium, which will increase the contraction. It also activate the uh, cyclooxygenase, which increase uh, the increase which is involved in the arachidonic acid metabolism to produce uh, thromboxane and also prostaglandin that uh, eventually leads to uh, contraction. And superoxide that is produced uh, as well will rapidly react with nitric oxides okay, to produce peroxy nitrate. And this peroxy nitrate is a radical that is more toxic than superoxide and this will lead to uncoupling of enos. And this process, as the uh, oxidative stress increases, this will go in circles, and this will reduce the relaxation. And here you can see that the contraction predominates, and this is one of the common characteristics that we see with endothelial dysfunction. And one thing that you commonly see with hypertension and so on, where you have an increase in contractility, so it increases the uh, blood pressure. Now, it's not very as simple as this. So if you use this diagram shows the complexity uh, of the interaction between the vascular endothelial factors uh, on the function of the vascular smooth muscle and circulating blood vessels. So in normal healthy endothelium or physiological condition, the nitric oxide is the one that is responsible for production of the uh, vascular nitric oxide. However, 
in pathological conditions, when you have oxidative, uh, all the stresses, it becomes a potent generator of ROS. Okay. And this is a vicious cycle, and this goes on and on continuously, which then you will continue increasing on the free radicals that subsequently increases inflammation, uh, also thrombosis, proliferation, and so on. Okay. So elevated oxidative stress then eventually will lead to decreased uh, nitric oxide bioavailability. So you have all the protective effect of NO that is lost or reduced. And this will lead to the exa exaggeration of the metabolic syndrome and also the progression of atherosclerosis and uh, subsequently to cardiovascular diseases. So what are the approaches that is used to treat uh, cardiovascular uh, diseases or even metabolic syndrome. Okay, so as I mentioned, the most commonly we see is an imbalance, less nitric oxide increase in free radicals due to all the stresses, okay, which is commonly seen with metabolic syndrome. And this leads to impairment of endothelial uh, nitric oxide dependent signaling, increases in oxidative stress, and also inflammation and which eventually leads to endothelial dysfunction. So the approaches that commonly used to study endothelial dysfunction in metabolic diseases is we usually target, mainly targeting um, signaling pathway that can improve the nitric oxide dependent signaling, can reduce the pathways that can reduce oxidative stress and pathways that can reduce inflammation. Uh, so far, okay, no issues, huh? I hope. Can you hear? No sound. All right, let me continue then. So, where does this natural product comes in? So, a lot of the natural product is used to study anti-diabetic effect, anti-hypertensive effect, or even anti-obesity effect. Yes, in addition to that, we also... Um, most commonly, we like to see whether these natural products also have uh, protects on the vascular functions as well, which will decrease the risk of cardiovascular diseases. So these are some of the well-known um, compounds that's already been shown, like flavonoids, like we eat onions a lot, which contain quercetin, casetin, and Indians, we tend to use turmeric in all our cooking, which has curcumin, Okay, uh, beans and so on has genistins, uh, isoflavonoids, uh, resveratrol, and so on. All this has been shown to increase nitric oxide production, and which is important to reduce the endothelial dysfunction. Although I keep emphasizing that the nitric oxide is one of the main important ones when we look at endothelial dysfunction. Okay, studies, um, we don't just look at the end products, most of the time they will look at the uh, pathways that increases the nitric oxide signaling. So example like black and green cheese, wine, grape, uh, cocoa, and so on. All this has looked at the upstream mechanism that is involved in increasing the levels of nitric oxide, which subsequently uh, contribute to the relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle. So besides looking at the nitric oxide, quite a number of studies has also shown that natural products have uh, effect on uh, pathways that's involved in inflammation. By decreasing inflammation, they increase the nitric oxide bioavailability. Also, um, natural products and also food uh, that has known to decrease oxidative stress pathways. Okay, so. All this sub eventually will lead to increasing in nitric oxide bioavailability. So what do we do in our lab? In my lab, a lot of the work we do is involving with um, animal models, okay, in vitro and also in vivo. So we work with animal models uh, that is yeah, for hypertension, diabetes, obesity. So any of these uh, signs that is connected to metabolic syndrome. And 
we will isolate the blood vessels uh, because uh, the focus is on the uh, vascular function. So we study vascular function using equipment that is known as the organ bar or myograph. Uh, we also not just do only animal, we also can uh, use the, uh, and for those who don't work with animals, use um, cell lines like uh, human um, umbilical vein endothelial cells or human aortic endothelial cells or any of the endothelial cell line or smooth muscle cell lines to study the effect on the function. We also have used another technique called organ culture. And this is like a culturing uh, process as well, but it uses the tissue. So we have worked with uh, mice iota mostly uh, doing organ culture where we culture it in the uh, DMEM media before we do the vascular function. Because a lot of this, we just don't say yes, it relax, causes relaxation, it, it decreases uh, contraction and so on. We want to study why. So we do a lot of mechanistic as well, either doing by PCR or Western blot, uh, doing immunohistochemistry or fluorescence. So as um, my part of the work focuses on uh, vascular function. So just if anyone have not, um, student-wise have not used an organ but So what we do normally is we take up the um, blood vessel. So this is just an illustration to show the uh, iota. So we clean the organ, remove the organs on the top and the iota is uh, at the back of the, uh, near the sternum. Okay. And then the iota is isolated and there's a lot of uh, uh, fatty tissues and connective tissues on the uh, vessel, which we have to clean. And you, the cleaned one will then will be cut into small rings. And those will be then mounted on the equipment. So as I mentioned, organ butt preparation. So there is a hook here and we will mount the ring in between the hook and this is connected to a transducer that detects when the uh, rings contract, it will pull. So it's, we measure the uh, isometric tension. Okay, so the organ bath is usually used for larger vessels like red iota. And another equipment that is commonly used is the myograph. And this is used to study a smaller vessels like resistant vessels like the renal artery, mesenteric artery, coronary arteries, uh, bacillar from the brain uh, or even any iota from the mice and so on. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, anyone can hear me? Hello. None. Okay, everything so far? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So once these uh, rings are mounted, and then we will do uh, concentration uh, dependent relaxation or contraction. So it will generate a tracing, something like this. So this is uh, adding acetylcholine, which is uh, uh, endogenous to uh, ligand to induce relaxation. So you have a dose dependent relaxation. So from this tracing is where we will transform the data to plot the graphs and so on. So uh, as my work focuses, um, we don't just focus on endothelial function alone. We do a lot of other things. But for this talk, a lot of the results that I'll be sharing with you is only uh, those that is related to endothelial function. So one of the earlier work that we did in our lab um, is using palm oil fraction. And this was done in the uh, 2010, uh, because palm oil is something that we Malaysian use a lot in our cooking, and um, we uh, and palm oil is known to be rich in uh, vitamin. It's a major source of vitamin E, so it has uh, tocopherol and tocotrienols. So uh, after a series of purification and concentration, uh, a highly purified vitamin uh, E was produced, and this was known as the tocotrienol rich fraction. And um, earlier before this goes into market, so they wanted us to also do some studies to see whether it has endothelial protective effect. 
So first thing we did was, of course, because we know vitamin E is an antioxidant, so we did an um, um, antioxidant assay. So uh, measuring DPPH inhibition uh, using tocotrienol rich fraction. And this tocotrienol rich fraction it has about 75% tocotrienol and 25% tocopherol. Both of these are actually vitamin E. And we found that it is equally good as a tocopherol, okay, and also quercetin, which is also known to have antioxidant. So yes, that was like to say, oh, okay, it has an antioxidant. So does it protect the endothelial function? So here, this is an in vitro study where we take the vessel from the different animal models and we look at the endothelial relaxation. So we use uh, rings from the diabetic animal and this is the STZ induced diabetic. So it's a type one uh, diabetic model. And we use rings from the SHR, which is known as spontaneously hypertensive red. And this is a hypertensive model and the control uh, group for both of these is the Vista Kyoto Red or WKY. So you can see the WKY control has a very good relaxation, about 80. So normally when we look at endothelial function, anything relaxation between um, 80 to 100 is considered as good relaxation. And we can see in the uh, diabetic vessel, the relaxation is reduced and in hypertensive vessel also, the relaxation is only about 50%. So there is a decrease in uh, relaxation. This shows that there is endothelial impairment. And subsequently, we uh, incubated okay, the rings with the fraction or tocopherol, poly, uh, palm olein, and also vehicle that we use to dilute. And we found because the relaxation in the WKY is already good, there's not much effect on in the rings that's from the WKY, right? But we see uh, this is where the initial relaxation was for the diabetic animal and treatment with uh, tocopherol, quercetin, uh, also um, palm oil has improved the relaxation, uh, but, but more so with the um, tocotrienol fractions and also the tocopherol and quercetin fraction much better. And similarly, in the hypertensive vessels also, we can see the tocotrienol fraction, uh, uh, tocopherol and uh, quercetin improve the relaxation. So this does show that the uh, tocotrienol rich fraction has endothelial protective effect against an, uh, hypertension and also diabetes. And this was uh, published in uh, nutritional research. Actually, this work was an undergraduate student's work that um, went on to write the paper. So if students from their, even undergraduate, you can even publish your research work. And then we went on to work uh, with a collaborator of ours from Taiwan, um, where we uh, worked with this uh, compound, or it's actually a tea, it's known as um, Lubuma, and it actually also known, the fraction is known as uh, AVLA, Epocyanum vanitum. Okay, and this is commonly uh, taken as a drink, a tea drink, uh, and it, they use it as um, drink it to reduce the blood pressure and so on. So what we wanted to know was how does this tea causes uh, or has an antihypertensive effect and uh, so we went on to look at it. Uh, so one of the factors, if you remember earlier when I said function of endothelium, angiotensin 2 is one of the factors that is involved in uh, causing contraction. So we looked at the effect of uh, AVLE in, on angiotensin 2 contraction. And we found that um, AVLE is able to decrease the contraction and to find out the mechanism, we incubated uh, with alnim. Alnim is an inhibitor of uh, uh, nitri endothelial nitric oxide synthase, ENOS. And uh, we found that it is, uh, even in the pre when you give uh, alnim and you have blocked the ENOS, the effect is lost. And um, 
we also use positive control to see whether the effect is um, using Tyron, which is a superoxide scavenger or losartan. So it has almost similar activity as that. Okay. And you can see that this effect is seen when there is endothelium. And sometimes we do experiment by removing the endothelium to see if this, uh, this effect is dependent on endothelium or not. And we found that AVLE is still able to cause relaxation even if there's no endothelium. That means it directly affects the smooth muscle as well. Now, we wanted to see whether this effect is specific for angiotensin II mediated uh, effect or it, does it work on even any other contractile uh, mediators. So we looked at the uh, penile afferent, which acts on the alpha adrenoceptors to cause the contraction. Now, one of the things um, previously reported was the AVLE uh, in releases nitric oxide. So we did uh, an experiment where we do a first phenylephrine contraction and then we wash it off, which means the compound is no more there. And then we contract again to see whether the effect of uh, phenylephrine contraction return back or not. And we found that even when the compound is not there, the relaxation is still decreased. That is kind of telling that the nitric oxide that is being produced is still uh, activated even without the compound. And But this is only seen in the rings that you have endothelium. That means it is only dependent on endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And we also measured the superoxide production and we found that in uh, when you have angiotensin II, angiotensin II can bind to AT1 receptor to activate the NADPH oxidase to uh, produce superoxide anions. And AVLE is able to reduce that. So this indicates that uh, AVLE has antioxidant scavenging ability. Now, because of this second part here, we showed that there is NOC being produced even after the AVLE is washed off. We went on to further study to see whether AVLE is able to synthesize and produce nitric oxide on its own. And several experiments, and these are in vitro experiments that's been carried out to look at the signaling pathway of nitric oxide to see where, if um, AVLE is able, at which point does AVLE act on to produce nitric oxide. And uh, so we use, um, we do the relaxation curve uh, to AVLE. So because AVLE on its own causes a slow relaxation. So we incubate AVLE, um, we incubate inhibitors that blocks uh, the mediators from the uh, like PP2, okay, which blocks the CERC, uh, Wotmanin, which blocks the PI3K, uh, L-name that blocks the ENOS, ODQ that blocks the guanylate cyclase uh, production, okay, uh, enzyme. So we do that to see which pathway, if the inhibitor is, uh, if this pathway is involved in the presence of the inhibitor, the effect is lost. So we can see that when uh, this is the relaxation of AVLE and we give PPE2, uh, uh, uh even um, LY290402, the relaxation is reduced. So this indicates that this pathway signaling is involved. And if you block with L-name, the relaxation is lost and we block with ODQ, the effect is lost. So this indicates that AVLE blocks the upstream of the nitric oxide synthase. And to confirm that, we also measure the total nitrate, uh, nitrates, uh, nitrate, nitrate production. Uh, and you, you can see that AVLE can increase the NO levels in the uh, serum. Okay. And to confirm the activity, whether the ENOS is increased, so we also do Western blot to see the activate, uh, activate, uh, activation um, protein, the ENOSER117, and we found that it is uh, increased in the presence of AVLE. Okay. 
And because earlier we said that the AV alley is able to scavenge superoxide and ion, so what we did another experiment was we um, do a, DP, a DHE staining. So DHE staining is used to measure superoxide and ion. This can be um, seen with the intensity increase in intensity, the red color intensity of the stain. Uh, so this is the iotic ring that is non cryostat staining. And you can see in control, the color or uh, red color is very faint. And NADPH, which is the generator of superoxide, the color uh, of the intensity of the rate is increased, which is you can see. And then in the presence of AVLE, various concentration and the intensity uh, of the stain has decreased. So this indicates that super AVLE has, possesses a superoxide scavenging activity. And this has been published. So we showed that. Uh, in hypertensive conditions that this, yes, this uh, AVLE is good as an antihypertensive agent, okay, uh, because it's able to decrease endothelial dysfunction at the same time protect, uh, gives a cardiovascular uh, protection. Another uh, work that was done was on an active compound itself, which is known as boldine. And this is from uh, leaf and barks. And this is already known to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-diabetic, and so on. What we wanted to know was the mechanism. So here we looked at a hyperglycemic condition. So insulin resistant and hyperglycemia. And this we use uh, a DBDB mice. And this mice is a type two diabetic model. And um, this mice is usually uh, it's black in color, quite, it's also obese. So you have a little bit of obesity and also you have insulin resistance and so on. So after one week of treatment, the rings from the DBDB mice has impairment. And when we treat uh, those that have been treated with bolding and also temple, which is a positive control, there's improvement in relaxation. So normally we also do another experiment with sodium nitroperoxide because nitro sodium nitroperoxide is an NO um, generator. So it acts directly on the smoke muscle. So this is like uh, to ensure that your smoke muscle is not uh, affected. The effect is only due to the endothelium. And you want to see whether it is due to uh, nitric oxide. We did the, uh, we measured the nitric uh, enos activity and we found that ENOS activity is decreased in the DBDB mice. And when you treat with bolding, there's an increase in the DBDB, uh, in the ENOS activity you've seen with Western blot. Now, not only that, we took the rings from the um, animal, the normal animals, the diabetic animals, and we did an in vitro treatment as well, a 12 hour in vitro treatment uh, to also uh, do. Um, uh, what you call to study the mechanism. So we, we had the speculation that it could be acting through by inhibiting um, an AT1 receptor, which activates the angio, uh, activated by the angiotensin 2. And an earlier work in our lab has shown another important protein, uh, bone morphogenic protein 4, which is also involved in endothelial function. So we inhibited the rings with those inhibitors, Nogin for inhibiting B BMP4 and Losartan to inhibit the AT1 receptor. And we found those uh, two, when, it, when those um, BMP4 and AT1 receptors are inhibited, the relaxation also improved. So it indicates that uh, Boldin has something similar activity as, it, uh, as an AT1 inhibitor or M uh, BMP4 inhibitor. So we went on to look at the protein level. So we found that DBDB mice has increased BMP4 proteins. It also has increased in AT1 receptors, which is shown uh, via the immunohistochemistry and also Western blot. And treating with bolding for one week, decreased the, decreased the BMP4 protein. It also decreased the AT1 uh, receptor protein. It also decreased the um, uh, nitrotyrosine, which is an oxidative stress marker. So both of these uh, proteins, BMP4 and AT1, will activate ROS. And we did an um, detected superoxide production through staining, two different types of staining. That one is the 
end phase endothelium one is looking at the whole ring and we found that the, in the DBDB mice, there is an increase in the superoxide production and treatment decreased the uh, uh, superoxide production. We also measured the level of the superoxide that is being produced and we found that uh, holding is able to impair the BMP4 and 81 receptor mediated ROS production. So was this uh, 81 and BMP4 dependent or independent effect? So to measure that, we did an in vitro uh, culture method and we found that uh, angiotensin 2 is able uh, to block BMP4. So this indicates that the effect is 81 BMP4 ROS pathway. So by inhibiting oxidative stress, increasing nitric oxide, sorry. So by inhibiting uh, nitric oxide, although I didn't show, we also found that it also increases the superoxide uh, dismutase level. So it also increases the antioxidant enzyme. So all this work was published by Dr. Lau Ye Xiang. She was the PhD student who worked on the bolding. And we also showed this in hypertensive models and also the type 1 diabetes model as well. Now, the other compound that our, in our lab we have worked on is vitafarin A. And it's from, it's a steroidal lactone that's from uh, Victafinia somifera, which is known as uh, astaganda cherry. So it of NF-kappa B, which is a signaling molecule in uh, inflammatory response. So two studies was done uh, using this. One is an in vitro study uh, to show fatty acid, free fatty acid induced oxidative stress. So this is in relation to obesity. And the second one is look, uh, to show the proof of concept. And this was done by uh, two students. So firstly, uh, we have showed that this is using uh, HUVAX so it's endothelial uh, human umbilical vein endothelial cells. And um, we can see palmitic acid increases the superoxide production, which is, uh, you can see with this green color intensity increase and uh, treatment with uh, palmitic, uh, sorry, uh, vitafarin decreases the intensity. So vitafarin suppresses the ROS production. And uh, by doing Western blot, we also showed that it reduces the inflammatory pathway by blocking the IF, uh, IKKB. So there's an increase in the palmitic acid uh, treated cells. And when you add metaphorin, it decreases. Uh, TNF alpha levels were also decreased with metaphorin and IL6, which are inflammatory markers, also was decreased with the treatment of uh, Metaphorin. And uh, insulin is, uh, we know that is also important for uptake of glucose and so on. And even in endothelial cells, we have uh, receptors for insulin. Okay. And um, so in control, we can see that the, uh, this is the inhibitory, um, uh, what do you call it? inhibitory site of the um, insulin receptor substrate, which is the where insulin go and bind to. So if the inhibitory um, is incre site is increased in the control, and here with treatment of vitafarin, it decreases the uh, inhibitory site. Okay, so this indicates that vitafarin also modulates the insulin receptor substrate. Uh, the serine tyrosine phosphorylation in the presence of palmitic acid. And of course, as I mentioned, we have to measure whether there is increase in nitric oxide and insulin is also involved in increasing nitric oxide production. So with the presence of vitafarin, there's an increase in nitric oxide level, okay, uh, which is decreased in the control. And we can see the um, upstream of the ENOS ACT and also ENOS also increases. So to confirm this um, in the IOTA, 
endothelial relaxation was also carried out and um, in, with palmitic acid, the relaxation is decreased and in the presence of vitafarin, the relaxation was able to increase. And to confirm this, so this was the signaling pathway we came up with. So palmitic acid causes uh, oxidative stress, increases the inflammatory signaling, which uh, increases the, uh, decreases the uh, insulin signaling which decreases the NO production and increase the vasoconstrictant enzymes, although I, uh, mediators. So all this was reversed when tuffering basically blocks mostly at the uh, oxidative stress pathway here. And in study, uh, in to confirm this, this was done with the animals. And you can see that vitafarin treatment actually decreased the levels of triglyceride and also cholesterol, and also improve the uh, glucose insulin resistance. So improve the, uh, decrease the insulin resistance uh, by doing the uh, oral, uh, oral glucose tolerance test and also insulin tolerance test. And also in, usually in obesity, you have hyperinsulinemia as well because it's a type almost like resistant. So there's a normalization of insulin and uh, all the inflammatory adipokines, TNF, IL-6, uh, which is elevated in the uh, uh, in the hepatin, uh, sorry, obese model, is decreased with the treatment of vitafarin. And leptin, which is increased, also is decreased. And adiponectin, which is a good uh, adipokine, is decreased in the obese animals and was reversed uh, in the was able to reverse back by the treatment of adiponectin. And adiponectin is uh, quite important as well for endothelial function. So this was uh, published in scientific reports and also in PLOS one. And the last part uh, project that we currently did and I'd like to share is um, study with edible bird nest. And this was um, in Chinese usually take a lot of this. Uh, I'm not sure whether the Indians do, uh, uh, do it much and in China even in Malaysia the Chinese tend to eat a lot of bird net and this is uh, actually is used in Chinese cuisine for a very long time because they say it prevents aging and improve overall well-being and uh, the active compound here is a salic acid which is like a glycoprotein so what we wanted to see is besides having antioxidant does it also protect the endothelial function and how does it do it so here we did um, in vitro experiment as well as in vivo. And again, here we use the DBDB mice. So in addition to all this, we also did look at the, whether it has anti-diabetic property and so on. But here I'll just talk about the endothelial function. And for in vitro, again, we use the HUAC cells as well as the mice iota, which we organ culture with uh, high glucose to mimic uh, hyperglycemic condition. Of course, we use uh, salic acid, which is a bioactive compound from the edible bird nest, and also glybenclamide, which is positive control, aposinine as uh, it is an antioxidant as the positive control as well. So at the end of treatment, um, so this is in vitro is 48 hours, and um, for in vivo is four weeks. We did the functional test, we also measured the ROS and NO level, and we did the Western block to show the activity. So for organ culture, when we treat the iota with high glucose, there's impairment in the endothelial function, and treatment with bird's nest, okay, improve the relaxation. And, it is, and all the positive controls, glybenclamide, salic acid, aposinine, also similarly improve the relaxation. And this is an in vitro result. And if you compare when we do in the uh, DBDB mice, we found also there's improvement in endothelial uh, relaxation uh, when treated with, uh, for four weeks with the um, edible bird nest. So this one is diabetic, the green and the blue are the ones that we treated with diabetic, two different concentration. And we measured the superoxide anion levels uh, and in high glucose, there's an increase. And 
with treatment with the uh, glybanclamide, with also with the bird's nest and all, de decreases the superoxide production. And we also to confirm we did with uh, also hydrogen, pero hydrogen peroxide, which is another uh, generator of superoxide and ion. So we see similar results. So it says that uh, edible bird nest can decrease the ROS production in IOTA that's been treated with high glucose. And the DAF, DAF FM fluorescent is a method uh, that is used to measure NO level uh, in, the, um, in the endothelial cells. So this is for cell lines. And we found in NO levels decrease in the um, uh, cells that's been treated with high glucose. And we, when it's treated with uh, bird's nest, there's an increase in NO level. And this is confirmed in also in the in vivo studies where in the DVDB animal, there's a decrease in the um, vascular NO level and treatment with a burst nest, especially the higher concentration, has an increase in the NO level. And all this, although we do, uh, we don't just do one assay to um, show that something is increased, we always confirm. And confirmation was done by using Bastom blot. So we measured the NOx2, which is a subunits of NADPH for uh, uh, oxidative stress, and uh, nitrotyrosine, which is an oxidative marker. We also looked at sodium dismutase, which is an antioxidant. Uh, we looked at the ENOS activity, and all this was um, reversed. I mean, uh, oxidative stress was increased, and uh, antioxidant and ENOS activity was decreased in the diabetic, and treatment increased the ENOS and also antioxidant level while decreasing the uh, NADPH uh, and also the uh, nit nitrotyrosine level. So this indicates that yes, bird's nest is actually um, just not for overall well-being, it is also uh, good in protecting the uh, blood vessels. So by reversing the imbalance between the uh, antioxidant and oxidative stress. So this was recently published in the Frontiers of Pharmacology. So in conclusion, what I like to say is when we do a lot of work with natural product and uh, the focus, um, when we talk about even metabolic diseases or cardiovascular diseases is we want to uh, bring back, increase the n nitric oxide levels and decrease the oxidative stress level. And so a lot of things, um, we target the nitric oxide signaling uh, or trying to reduce the oxidative stress and inflammation. So we can look at all the different targets or pathways that's involved in all this signaling. So when you have this, you have a healthy vessel, which then uh, reduces the cardiovascular risk complication, which is uh, quite common when you have a metabolic syndrome. So with that, I would like to thank all the postgraduate students who has contributed to the work, of course, collaborators from my own lab and also collaborators from uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong who has uh, contributed some of the natural product that we have worked with. With that, I would like to thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you for being such a nice, uh, very informative presentation regarding the endothelial dysfunction. In the participant, any questionnaire, any clarifications, you can uh, interact with the speaker. Any questions from the participants? Sorry, I can't hear. Is there a question? Mm. Oh, yeah. Seems to be no question. 
quite common with hey, yeah. just for my clarification uh, uh, mm. normally we people uh, say like uh, taking palm oil uh, it's not uh, good for health and it might increase the bad cholesterol mm. but study uh, you say it has some kind of uh, beneficial effect so uh, uh, what is your i mean view on this one uh, taking palm oil uh, actually there's also quite a number of study that now looks at you know reusing the oil you know most of the time when we use the cooking oil right you don't just like use it once sometimes you reuse the oil for cooking and all that's definitely not good uh, because it get oxidized and so on that will worsen the impairment uh, what is this is if you use a lot of the palm oil that's being sold in the supermarkets here they say free cholesterol and all those thing so they wanted to confirm that yes if this palm oil that um so it does have some kind of protective effect so it's valid to put that you know um it is good for heart and you always seen this and i guess if you're using the palm oil just one time you know for cooking and it's not overheated and all it does have beneficial effect it's the only thing is um i, I don't know because it, most of the time what we tend to do is we have when we fry and we reuse the oil over and um, twice or something like that and that's definitely not good so this is like little bit of palm oil that is used for normal vegetable cooking and stuff that then that's okay okay any more questions Um, yeah, ma'am. This is Dr. Shivaram here. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, doctor. Uh, see, like uh, most of the modules that you have elucidated is uh, probably on the uh, in vivo part, right? Like uh, I came across some of few journals wherein, like uh, this similar kind of activity, they can able to app through some of the. in which so probably in the cell line module so see for a brief understanding i am asking like uh, uh, in your perspective like uh, how so for this in vitro that's probably on uh, cell line uh, cultured work uh, is being yeah. of giving prompt answers on this uh it let's say because not a lot of laboratories have, can afford to buy the animals and do the work if you notice even the last uh, bit that i showed with edible bird nest we have done with um, qx which is in a cell line model so but um cell line model is more like if you want to test something and you just um, most of the time it's commonly used for screening purposes that you want to see if a compound has possibility of uh releasing a uh, nitric oxide or also a uh, superoxide level so you can actually um use these cultures uh, endothelial cell line cultures or smooth muscle uh, cell line cultures and you can um you uh, you can treat your compound and then after that you do assay to measure the no level or you measure the superoxide level so this is like a preliminary work most of the time the cell culture work that is used is something to um to make sure that the compound is working before they proceed to buy animals and actually do a more thorough study so yes you can do on the cell line to actually first understand the mechanism because sometimes we may not have enough tissues from the animal to do the mechanistic study to understand the signaling pathway so this uh, working on the cell line will allow us to knock out a particular uh, protein to uh, if we are saying like okay this one is working through 81 receptor so you want to confirm that it works on the 81 receptor you can knock down the 81 receptors and then you treat the compound and if the compound doesn't have any effect and then you can say ah yes this is through the 81 receptor so usually the cell line is um used um for more mechanistic uh, purposes uh to support the animal work or the in vivo work or as i said to do the preliminary screening to see if something has an no um activating uh, activity or a superoxide scavenging activity then they do use cell line oh thank you doctor thanks for your uh, nice information thank you so much okay any more queries 
Hello. Yes. Ma'am, this is Dr. Alvin from Chennai. Thanks for the nice presentation. Okay. Ma'am, uh, we would like to know the possibility of uh, gene trigger when we do this kind of a metabolic studies. Gene? Trigger of gene. Uh, gene, it depends on what pathways you are interested in. Look, uh, my lab, because we straight go to protein, uh, you can always look at all the, say, the proteins that we have looked at. They also have their genes. So you can still look at the uh, genes that is involved in uh, all the NADPH oxidase or cytochrome P40 xanthine oxidase or the genes for ENOS and all. But why we straight go to protein? Because from the gene, it translates into protein and the protein is the one that will show the effect. So we tend to go straight to a Western block to do the protein. So some labs uh, will just do the gene expression so all the protein that I mentioned just now, they also have their genes. So you can always look at the genes uh, of the similar proteins as well. Or if you have a particular pathway, like I think uh, on Dr. Giri has uh, uh, talked about the inflammatory pathway, there's genes for the all the inflammation, the TNF, IL-6, uh, even the IKKB or NF-kappa-B or even NRF2 or sodium dismutase, all of them has genes as well. So you can uh, look at the gene alone, or if you want to confirm that the gene get translated to form the protein, then you do a Western block to show that the protein is also increased or decreased. Because sometimes it may be increased in the gene, but it is not translated in the protein. So, uh, there's always that question. So because my mentor always makes us uh, used to tell us, you don't just depend on the gene, you also have to look at protein. So we tend to look more on the protein, but this same proteins, you can just study the genes as well. So there's no um, no problem with that as well. So all the same, same genes. Does that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. thank you. There is no further queries. Uh, we should conclude this session. So, thank you, madam. Thank you for giving us such an informative session. Okay, thank you we very are, much. On behalf of our uh, Department of Pharmacology of Pharmaceutical Sciences, so we are thanking you for uh, taking an active participation in this uh, international faculty development program. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay, the dear participant, uh, so with this, today's session is going to be concluded. And tomorrow at the same time, there is 11 o'clock, uh, we will join. And uh, the speaker, uh, Mahendra and Shekhar, who is going to be presenting on creative mind uh, in natural product research. So, hope uh, we'll be joining tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.